if you want to get faster, just practice a little faster. If you just do that a couple times a week, take some time to try and go faster um, and work with a radar. Just that helps. And then the second major thing is to like increase golf swing muscles, in particular the ones that you use in the downswing. And you can do some basic band exercises. Band isometrics are a really good one to build your strength. Most people don't do anything for their speed. So whether you're a lady, a junior, an amateur player, a senior that's not swinging as fast as you once did and you want to get a little bit of that speed back, just taking a little time, a couple times a week, working on increasing your golf swing strength and practicing swinging fast. The results that you can get in a month are really amazing. I was consistently seeing 12 to 16 miles an hour, which is 30 to 40 yards. Hi, this is Jeff Watson from Santa Ana, California, and I play at Willowick Golf Course. This is Golf Smarter number 888. Swing speed training to increase your distance without bulking up like Bryson. Featuring Jacob Bowden. This is Golf Smarter. Sharing stories, tips, and insights from great golf minds to help you lower your score and raise your golf IQ. Here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome back to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Jacob. Uh, hello, Fred. Lovely to be back again for the fifth time. Yeah, for the fifth time, but the first time we met was 14 years ago. You were just a, a baby. You were just out of diapers. And uh, I remember that episode, you were talking about chasing a championship. You were kind of new to golf at the time, I, it feels like, but you had this idea that you wanted to play in a national championship more than once. Uh, well, there, let's see, that would have been two, episode 209, 2009. I turned pro right. in 2003, so it was early in my career. 2009, I would have been... 33 and yeah the whole the the whole idea was just um when i when i first started i was 27 and i was a 14 handicap at the time and uh the whole thing i guess with the start of my journey was like can i make make it as a pro turn from this 40 handicap and, and make a living in golf and turn pro and maybe one day get in the get in the tour event so it yeah, uh, I mean, I remember. I kind of remember the conversation because I, I did. I wasn't rolling my eyes at you, like, "Yeah, right, you're going to make a tour event as a 14 handicap." But I just there was something about you that made me believe that you could do it. Yeah, it was. I mean, kind of crazy to think that uh, just to consider that. Um, yeah, being in the 14 handicap as a tour. It would have been different if it like, oh, you're a 14 handicap and you're 14 years old. Like, right. okay, you got you got a little bit more time, like there's some time to develop. But like, all right, you're already an adult. You're like into adulthood, not you're just an average golfer. Like what, what, I mean, this is kind of ridiculous going for something like that. But um, yeah, I guess looking back at it now, it's like I, I was working, worked a corporate job for five years and um I wasn't particularly happy. Sports was always a, a big love of mine. Um, I had a tryout for the Twins with baseball. Um, I played Division Two basketball in college, so sports was like super important to me. And after neither of those worked out, I thought, well, I guess that's it. And then yeah. um, uh, there was, let's see, it was 2001. So during that five-year period, I was thinking, like, gosh, what am I going to do with my life? So I, I just started with a bucket list and like, all right, let me just start doing some things off this list. And one of the things on the list was to go to every major sports event at least once. So like one Super Bowl, one NBA Finals, one NHL, like, you know, all these things, Stanley Cup. And, and I was working you... and the, the PJ Championship happened to be in Atlanta when I was doing a, a, a corporate um, education there. And the last day got canceled. So I was like, Ooh, I got an extra day. I'm like, let me go over to the PGA championship. And when I got it, I just, I got myself a ticket, went on the grounds. And if you ever been to a tour event, you know, that like the, the players are playing on the, on the course, of course, and then it's roped off and then all the fans are on the side. Um, and as the players pass, they open up the ropes and let the, the people 
across the course basically. And there was this one spot on the course where they opened up the ropes and I was the only person crossing. And I got out there and all of a sudden when I got in the middle, I had the view of being inside the ropes, being a player. And it was the strangest thing. It felt like the sky lit up and I got warm and I was like, wait a minute, like maybe I could be a pro golfer. It was just like this ridiculous thought. Um, so it took me about a, a, a year to like, like consider like, I mean, is this, is this even feasible? And, it, and my, my job got, uh, uh, th- there were a couple buyouts and, and corporate culture is, is difficult when you're going through buyouts. So the, I got unhappy enough in the job. And then also I was like, you know, um, 27 but like maybe let me try and just see like and then i'll at least know i've got unlike other sports where you got to retire when you're 30 or 35 with golf if you're healthy and motivated just you can almost do it like a full career playing to your 50s and 60s so it's like i got time i've got a little bit of background in other sports that maybe i can apply to this and and put together a plan and give it a shot and um yeah, one day I just kind of finally got the courage to, to give it a go and give it a turn. And you've done many things. I mean, you were involved in speed golf. You were involved in long drive championships. You've been involved in, in tour events. You've done them all, huh? Yeah, it's it's kind of been... Uh, all of it was in an effort to just try and keep 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 things going and, and with the end goal and just find ways to kind of survive in a way. <laughs> um, and, and just cause it's like, uh, you know, I got myself good enough to turn pro pretty quickly, um, which was amazing in itself. But then once you're good enough to turn pro, it's like, it's kind of like being a starving artist in a way. It's like, unless you're in the, the, the top of the bunch, you could do amazingly well at the top of the bunch, but for a lot of other people, it's just, it's the starving artist lifestyle. So I'm sleeping in my car, sleeping in tents, mm. um, just, and just struggling, you know, trying to find ways to patch it together and keep it going. And then in the process of doing that, I found my way into all these other things. So I competed in long drives for a while. Um, and through that, I kind of learned about swing speed training. And that was part of the genesis and of this swingman golf business that was launched in 2007 was, People were curious, one, how I made that transition from 14 to handicap to pro, but then also, like, how did I start hitting the ball longer? Um, so that, that that was part of the genesis of that. And then from that, I got into um, speed golf, uh, which was really fun to be a part of. Um, I finished fifth in the world championships with that. And, and uh, I remember in the 2000. 12 i believe they aired it right before the masters on cbs so it was like cool to be a part of that and in 2013 i had the the i set the record for um golf score at the world championships and shot us 72 and 55 minutes with six clubs um so that was pretty cool and amazing and then uh, you know that all um, those kind of things it led to single leg fire too um, and uh, that, ooh, I believe we talked about that in um, episode 623. Yeah, we talked about your single length irons in 2018. So Sterling irons, that uh, we ran those from 2016 to 2020. Um, so super cool. I never would have thought. Were those in the, the irons beginning, that like, would Bryson DeChambeau played? Um, he, no. He, was, no, he was playing single length irons at the time, wasn't he? Or is he yes. still? I don't know. Yes. Uh, he still is. Um, he just, he originally signed with Kobe. Well, uh, Kobe. let me back that up. And this is kind of a funny story too, actually. Um, so I was uh, playing single length irons. I really believed in them. And, uh, in 2007, 8, 9, 10, I shot my first round and turned around in the 60s. I was like, yes, I love single length irons. But I felt like they needed to be improved. And in 2010, if you remember, the groove rule changed. Right. Um, and none of the manufacturers wanted to update their, their groove. So I, I kind of had to go back to uh, conventional variable length sets for a while. And I was lo- trying to find a way, how can I play single length irons again? And so originally I asked Tom Wachon of Wachon Golf, 
Mm -hmm. Um, and he said, he He said no the first, first time. Yeah. He was not a fan. Uh, Not at the time. Um, that that changed eventually. And he was never, never. And then, um, and then, well, it was interesting when I went back to him for the second time, we decided to partner up on that with me. So we, he did end up having a change in of, of opinion on that. Okay. Um, but uh, sidebar, we, so I was, he hadn't yet changed his mind. So I was like, I, I asked uh, David Adele in the Dell call, like, hey, do you want to do something like that? And like, could you make me a set? And he said no. But then I later found out that Bryson, while he was still an amateur, went to David and also asked if he could make a single link set of iron. So I don't know if I inadvertently planted the seed in David's head to like to, to do that or 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 what. But um, so David built Bryson uh, his original set of Adele's, and then when Bryson won the U.S. Amateur, it was with the, his set of Adele's. And then when he turned pro, um, he went with Cobra, and then Cobra designed their single uh, single like ours. Um, and when Bryson was going through that, uh, I also asked him. Uh, this he was more accessible then; he could just message him on Facebook because <laughs> he was still an amateur <laughs> at the time. And I was like, "Hey, Bryson, you want like we're doing these Sterling irons? Like, do you want to do you want to play these? These are like way better, and the the, the 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 performance is fantastic. And we really saw kept a lot of the things that worked in single length, but di- um, fixed a lot of the historic problems also. But he ended up going with Cobra, and I understand that because Cobra's able to combine with Puma, offer him apparel, and like you know a big big financial contract like that. Just mm. couldn't do that at the time, so. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was interesting like uh, Bryson uh, has been into long drive and single leg firing for you wore the that I forget the type of cap that he had but it was funny because I was like doing a lot of those same things before him also I didn't um, achieve the same level of playing success that he did but it was interesting that we were he was kind of like following we were uh, interlaced a little bit in Getting into long drive, doing speed golf, or, uh, sorry, not speed golf, uh, swing speed training, single leg firearms, all these things. Mm. Interesting. Hey, listen, we're going to take a time out. Uh, we'll be back right after this. Jacob, when you were doing the long drive uh, championships, um, and we'll get to speed golf too, but I'm just curious what the mindset is in long drive champion. I mean, everybody wants to hit the ball farther, right? But competing for long drive has got to be different than just hitting it farther off the tee. Is there a is there a huge mindset difference that you found between the two? Um, it is a little bit. Different, yeah. The, the the average swing speed of a PJ Tour player now is about 114, and it kind of ranges on tour from 105 to maybe 125 average usually each year. And the typical long driver is going to be swinging 135, um, and then the top guys are in the 140s and even in the 150s. Now. So they're really really swinging fast, and um, there is the the vibe around the events are a little bit different with golf. You're trying to hit it far, of course, but you need to control it also. So, sure. um, typically I, in, at least in my measurements, guys are swinging 92% to 96% of their max on the golf course. Um, so, uh, but in long drive, oftentimes in long drive, it's, uh, the, you're swinging as hard as you can, pretty much. Um, you don't have to get every single ball, and you're just trying to get that one in. And typically, long drive is a little bit more ego, a little bit younger guys, more guys in their 20s versus uh, a, a broader range of like you know 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s in golf. So, the, to me, that. I, I guess I'm kind of like more I the spiritual side of golf appeals to me. Um and mm-hmm. I'm not particularly driven by my 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 ego or money or power or whatever. So um the the that, that vibe around long time is a little bit different cuz it's all about 
you know, who has the longest drive. Um, mm. So it, it, is, it is a bit different. Talking, that, that's the ego part you're yeah. referring to is just like, I'm going to hit it farther than you. <laughs> yeah. There, I mean, there, there is a little bit of that. You, you feel that a little bit when you go to those events. Um, so, um, not to say that there aren't egos in regular golf also, but yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> there, there, there is a, di- a difference in how those events feel and the, the goal is also what you're trying to do. Um, long drivers to they're, they're, I guess in both, you're trying to maximize your equipment as best as you can. Um, you're trying to, to, to be good at long drive. Now you also have to have pretty good technique. Um, although the technique and long drive is you're, you're really trying to get all the power th- pieces, um, and enough accuracy, uh, we, in golf, you're trying to have a little bit of both. Um, mm-hmm. and then with the training, um, swing speed training, starting to gain a little bit more popularity now, I guess, and awareness long drive guys have been doing it, that kind of stuff for a long time. No, no one swings as fast as they do. Um, naturally they're all working at it, um, working on their bodies to be able to make their swings, but just as fast as possible. Um, and you're starting to see a little bit of that filter into like tour, tour golf now, um, yeah. not to the same extent as long drive, but I think eventually that's, that will filter down into regular golf and, um, Golf fitness, I guess, is popular, but you can be fit and not fast. So there's um, the tour has a lot of fitness, starting to do some speed work. They still have a lot to learn, I think, as far as the, the getting their club dead speed up. Um, and you, you see also that there's a correlation between speed and handicap. So um, and you see starting you see that in the data now. So eventually that's going to find its way down on tour. I, I don't know how long it's going to take, but I think that's coming. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, you know, you talk about the egos and one of the things that we hear so frequently from instructors and tour players is that when you're playing competitive golf and this could be recreational players as well, but when you're playing competitive golf, you got to lose the ego. You can't, um, you know, on the golf course, you can't like, yeah, I can do this shot because I've seen it on TV. No, man, if you haven't practiced it, just don't try to be a hero that you don't know what, you know, what you're doing. So you really got to yeah. keep that in check. There, there is a definitely a, um, a mental component in a, in a wrangling of your ego. Um, like, do you, should you hit a six iron when you think you can get the seven iron there? Um, are you affected by other playing partners. Um, it's, it's interesting to watch people sometimes when either they are the longest hitter and have the effect it has on the group or they're, you're one of the, the other people in the group are longer than you and how sometimes that affects people. And they maybe try and start doing things that swinging, swinging beyond what they can, they can really control. So yeah, there's definitely a, like, um, I think uh, as you develop as a golfer, there you kind of have to reckon a little bit um, with yourself internally to to get the most out of yourself. Uh, you seem to uh, have a thing for the swing swing speed training, um, thinking that there's value, or you believe there's value to it for everybody. Let's talk about it a little bit on on what you do for your swing speed training, what you recommend. Um, swing speed training, it, that's been an interesting evolution. When I first started, I competed in long drive in 2000, I think three, six and seven. Um, and back in long swingman golf, which was about swing speed training, primarily about swing speed training in 2007. So back then people didn't even, a lot of the pushback I would get, people didn't even believe that you could do that. It's like, you get even quotes from like Tiger Woods and, and Bubba Watson, and he'd be like, "All right, well, you're either faster or not, and you just you know, mm-hmm. yeah, and that's it." Um, and I remember one time my introduction to Barney Adams of Adams Call. Oh, um, I love Barney. One time I got a, 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 I just opened up my email and I got this 
playing the email. I was like, Barney Adams, is, is this like the Barney Adams? He's like, what are you doing making these claims that you can like increase just when he's like, no one can do that. You can't do that. So he's, he's kind of funny. Like that was my uh, intro to, to having a relationship with Barney. Um, but awesome? then um, <laughs> he's, he's, he's a character. He, I just love um, having and, on and ask a question and he can riff on it for 25 minutes and it just, oh. you know, he's so old school um, that it, can, it's sometimes humorous and sometimes insightful. <laughs> but but now with the swing speed trading, it's it's evolved a little bit. Like Bryce and me, with as much I don't know media attention that he gets, he really brought a lot of attention. To like, hey, you can actually change the body and, and um, significantly, like really significantly increase your swing speed. But now. Um, I mean, he put on a lot of weight to do that, but what people don't realize is you don't actually have to put on that kind of weight to gain that kind of speed. So, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, so swing speed training is something that I think, uh, can benefit. You can probably start doing it in high school age, um, uh, like 14 to 18. Um, and then, uh, it, it helps regular golfers uh just doing some basic things like there's two main things with swing speed training one if you want to get faster just practice swing faster if you just do that a couple times a week take some time to try and go faster um and work with a radar just that helps and then the second major thing is to like increase the strength golf swing muscles in particular the ones that you use in the downswing and you can do some just basic band exercises um, isometrics are really good. band isometrics are a really good one to do for that to to build your strength and and if most people don't do anything for their speed so whether you're a, um, a lady a junior um, an amateur player a senior that's maybe not swinging as fast as as you once did and you want to kind of cut that off or get a little bit of that speed back just taking a little time and, and a couple times a week working on increasing your golf swing strength and practicing swinging fast. The the results that you can get in a month are really amazing. I was consistently seeing 12 to 16 miles an hour, which is 30 to 40 yards. Whoa. It, it's it's really significant. Um, it does take a little bit of elbow grease on your part. You got to put in a little bit of work, but it's there for the taking. Um, so it's not just for long drivers or uh who are the ones that are mostly doing it or tour players who are starting to do it. It's, it's really for everyone and you can take it as, as, as far as you want. Um, I've had some, Oh, I forget some of the ladies that were maybe swinging in the fifties or sixties and they get up in seventies or eighties. Wow. Um, uh, so, you know, not a significant increase. And then like, um, there were a couple guys, gosh, they were started out in the 90s, uh, which is a, t- a typical amateur will swing about 93 miles an hour. Um, so just normal amateur swing speed. And then they, well, probably in about six months of work, got up in the 130s and 140s and started competing in long drive. And it's, uh, what is, uh, 40 miles an hour is 100 yards, roughly. So they like literally added a hundred yards to, their, to the, how far they were hitting. It's really amazing. So that's the extreme end of like someone working really hard and being dedicated and, and doing all the things that you can do to, to really increase your speed. But it, it's and he did. They didn't have to put on forty pounds of weight um, like Bryson did to, to be able to achieve that. It's just a lot of smart training, basically. And that's what a lot of the like the swing that golf stuff is about is we we've been doing the swing speed training stuff for a long time now uh, since 2007, uh, and then the PJ Magazine just launched this uh, Golf Fitness Association of America, and we won the uh, national awards um, from the GFA in the last two years for this work in swing speed training. So it's awesome. Um, it's awesome. it's a it's a really great thing, and you don't. You can do a lot with it. You don't have to. Just doing a few little basics can really make a big difference to uh, anyone's golf game. Wow. 
Uh, hey, uh, time for another quick timeout. I want to continue this part of the conversation. We'll be back right after this. Okay, so you don't have to bulk up like Bryson to increase your swing speed. And to increase your swing speed, you're going to get more distance. The key to everybody. They just want to learn how to hit it better and think they're going to hit it farther. But you're saying the the better way to do that is... I guess go to swingmangolf.com and start working with you on increasing your swing speed, right? Well, the, the, um, with swing speed, there's a correlation between swing speed and handicap. So if you're interested in becoming a better player and lowering your handicap and shooting lower scores, more swing speed will help. Um, and it's not uh, one of the things I'll bump up and do with people on this is like, Oh, well, if I start swinging faster, I hit it off the planet um, <laughs> or off the golf course. So there's a, there's a, it's important to differentiate between your uh, control speed and your max speed. So like I said, the in my testing, people can generally, they, they always say like, oh, it swing to 80%. And I was kind of wondering like, what, what, what is the real percentage? So I tested a bunch of people and it's typically people can, keep good control, pretty good control, about 92 to 96% of their max swing. So that's what you want to play with. But with the swing speed training, you're working on your 100%. So the idea is to raise your 100% over time so that when you back off to that 92 to 96% to, to control your ball, basically, it's gone up proportionally, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I get that. And you'll see it not just off the tee. You're going to see it with all your clubs, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, someone might, if they go up 10 miles an hour, they're going to be 25 yards farther off the tee. But you might pick up a club uh, of distance on your irons, too. So you might be coming into a green with a 9 iron instead of a 6 iron. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's really amazing to, like, to... <laughs> I always get a kick out of when I when I maybe play golf with someone before and after, and one of these guys. This is one in particular, Phil Reed. Um, he uh, was a author and um, written some books in California, and I, I played with him. He was one of the initial people I did uh, uh, testing on, and <laughs> he was he didn't know he felt like he didn't know how to play his own home course that he played a billion times because he was just heading it into places that he never been before. <laughs> oh, interesting. Kind of changes your game. So it's, it's, it's swing speed training is, is not the only thing that you can do, of course, to become a better player and hit the of ball course. longer, but um, it is an important, it, it is something you can do. And right. If and you're, it can be a contributing factor. Sure. Yes. Yes. That's but it takes sure. work. It does. Um, I guess most of it. Well, you could go through an equipment fitting. That doesn't take much work. But that, So that's kind of low-hanging fruit. Uh, maybe working on your technique. Um, that takes a little bit of work. But um, you know, it's just some basic profoundness. Maybe you can strike them all a little bit more consistently. So, um, so the, the, the swing speed training does take a little bit of effort. Um, but maybe not as much as you think, and you certainly don't have to put on 40 pounds away like Barson did. Yeah, yeah. So, And you were also involved in speed golf, which is different than speed swing training. Swing yeah. speed, swing speed training. Right, right, a different kind of speed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tell me about um, that. I've always fascinated me. Speed golf is basically playing golf as fast as you can and shooting as low as you can. And, and so a speed golf score will take your golf score plus your time. And that's your speed golf score. So the okay. idea, so it takes a little bit of, um, there's a little bit of strat and in the, the speed golf world, um, you a lot of max or seven clubs. So basically like offset, if you took out your odd irons or even irons, you would basically have like what you could work with. So, but it's, it's, yeah, it's kind of interesting. So 
the strategy is kind of have to tailor it to yourself, I guess. So for me, I'm typically way about 215 and I'm 6'2", so I'm a pretty large person. I'm not really built for distance running, but mm-hmm. I'm a really great golfer. So for me, I like to carry, I'll take a little less time or I'll take more time on my running and maybe be one of the slower runners at the world championships, but I'll be shooting the best scores. You know, so I'll take a full set of clubs, well, seven, six or seven clubs. Whereas uh, there was, I remember in the one of the world championships, um, Bernard Lagat was there and he's amazing to see watch or to watch run in person. It's like, just like a, deer gazelles it's just kind of jaw (laughs) jaw dropping how beautiful it is to see someone like that run so he's an excellent runner but he's like not really a good golfer um so he he like will you know blow me out of the water on the run part but his golf score will be higher so you know so there's a little bit of strategy some people will take like uh, just a six hundred and and play so you're carrying less and you can run faster so you take that um, you can use your advantage in that and then just try and shoot a reasonable score with your one club so it's 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 interesting i guess what what people try and do and sure and the strategies that they take sure what what was in your bag what do you carry when you're um when you're playing speed golf, are you focused more on uh, wedges or longer clubs? What do you, how do you do it? I took a putter and I'm, most everyone's going to take a putter unless you take sure. like, say a six iron and you try and blade it a little bit to, to putt it. Um, so I had a putter and then I was like, all right, let me take a driver. Also, some guys will take like a three wood or a hybrid. I took a driver because um, I, I, I don't mind taking a little bit off of the driver. I, I can hit a partial uh, drive with a driver, um, which some people might think would be kind of hard, but it's actually not too too bad to do if you just practice with it a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. So I could hit a driver three-wood distance or hybrid distance. And then between that, it's like, I, I think I would do, I didn't want to take a lob wedge because you could open up, like, say, a sandwich or a gap wedge to play flop shots around the green if you need to. But with a 60 degree, like a lob wedge, you can't hit it as far as, like, right. say, a gap wedge or sandwich. So I would typically take a gap wedge or a sandwich because I could get a little bit of distance, but then I could still ease it around the green. And then between that, I would kind of like divvy up. I would try to space it out as best as I could. So I might take. Uh, let's see, so I have driver, putter, and that's two. And then if I have four other clubs, I take like a wedge, and then maybe like an eight iron, a five iron, and like a hybrid. So just kind of like space it out um, mm-hmm. so that you can kind of have a pretty even spread on on your distances. And then you just kind of feel out the shots and, and play a lot, of, a lot of partial shots, or if you're if you're good at hitting draws or fades, you can like do it like that. Um, yeah. So it's, 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 it's fun. Um, well, I guess it, I, I enjoyed aspects of speed golf. I enjoyed the creativity of speed golf. Um, I'm, but I'm, I'm not really a distance runner. So like, I, don't, I didn't really, <laughs> I, I liked, I like casual jogging. Um, but when you're in the world championships, you're like really, really rubbing it up. So it's like, you know, I did the band of dance in 72 and 55 minutes. So it was like 55 oh. minutes of 55 minutes of pain. I'm just, yeah, it, it, it's, it's really uncomfortable to like, to be running as hard as, you know, getting your heart rate up really, really high and, and just sustaining that. So well, I didn't Yeah. Plus band and dunes like can get, yeah. Band and dunes can get pretty windy and you're yes. running in that. Um, yep. and also it's the kind of golf course you want to absorb as much as you can. You don't want to be done in an hour abandoned tunes. Right, right, right. <laughs> unless you're competing on, uh, for speed golf. Well, that's the thing about it too. It's like, you know, at the world championships, you are trying to go as fast as you can, but if you want to do speed golf casual recreationally, um, it's kind of a, it can be a cool thing to do. So 
you know, one of the complaints about golf is it takes a long time. So if you got to get to work at eight or nine or whatever, yeah, um, you could pop out to your course, be one of the first people off. Yeah, to get you've got to be everyone. one of the first guys off the tee. You you can't have anybody in front of you. And then you play nine holes, but you could just kind of just do a very very light jog and finish clear though and do nine holes in an hour and a half or something. Um, mm -hmm. So you, you can get your nine holes in um, and still, you know, be able to get to work on time or whatever. So that's one way of doing it. Or um, sometimes it's good to go at the end of the day also because um, sometimes out for training, I would go out at the end of the day. And most people, you know, an hour before sunset, no one is going off the first tee because they're just not going to have time to finish nine holes. So yeah. you can go to the first the, that first team and then play a few holes and then maybe if the the course is a back and forth type course you can skip over a hole and then loop back and just do the first second third hole again and just kind of do it that way. Um, but it's an inter interesting way to get a bit of exercise and get a little bit of cardio in. And if you want to go a little slower, just to enjoy the course and you don't. Yeah. Oh, that's Even my friends who do cardio, I don't think they like to do it on the golf course. I have a friend that I play <laughs> with regularly who's a runner, but it's like, yeah, I'm not interested in running with my golf clubs. I right, listen, <laughs> um, you know, uh, we have golf smarter mulligans is when we play the uh, some older episodes and we bring them back um, and we'll be getting to, uh, you know, one of the, the second episode you were on in 2012 was, uh, a members only episode. So it's never been heard before. So I don't think that's coming up too soon, um, but it is going to be coming up. So hopefully we'll do that, but let's find out what's happening in golf smarter mulligans this weekend, because it's time for Tony Manzoni. This week is number five of nine in our Tony Manzoni series to help you launch your new golf season. In this episode, we talk about a variety of topics, including growing up in the shadow of greatness and shot making. But you should be able to take a, a pitching wedge out and hit it 50, 60, 70, mm. 80. Now you should be able to hit it all those distances. That's called shot making. Uh, the great players like Hogan, he would hit every club in the bag in, during a practice round 25 times and he'd hit them different trajectories left to right right to left high and low uh, and he could stand out there and with his whole set of clubs and hit a green about 150 160 with every club in the bag including the driver so he had the ability to speed it up or slow it down and still make a, a legitimate swing and, and hit the ball flush that's what's missing today if a person would take the clubs that they have and practice with them and use them for different distances, you'd be surprised. They could literally eliminate some of the clubs in their bag and still, have, and still be able to play without any problem. That's Golf Smarter Mulligans episode 204, the fifth of nine featuring our friend and mentor, Tony Manzoni. Check the show notes to learn how to get Tony's book, The Lost Fundamental, One Simple Move, Better Golf Forever, and gain access to his video of the same name. Please subscribe for free to our sister podcast that revisits the best of the Golf Smarter podcast called Golf Smarter Mulligans, being released every Friday from wherever you're listening right now. And with all those dreams that you had, my friend, of like seeing, like you walk in the middle of a golf course during a tournament going, I can do this. I can be a professional golfer. You have played on tour. Um, you've had some tour experience. Tell me about that. Uh, yeah, I've, I've played. I haven't yet played in a PGA Tour event. Um, I've done uh some qualifiers uh for tour pj tour events but i have played a lot of other um, there's a lot of other various tours around the world um let's see i've done the Pepsi tour the hooters tour uh, done open qualifying british open qualifying u.s open qualifying pj form pigeon qualifying um, i think i finished off with the poland open mm. with the Ch challenge tour I think it's still called the Challenge Tour. It's Europe's, uh, it's kind of like the Grand Prix Tour of, of European Tour, DP World Tour. I'm constantly changing the names. Um, but yeah. I played in the... Depending uh, on the who the sponsor is that month. You're right. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I played the Tusker Kenya Open. So, like, as um, coming, looking back now, um, I started this when I was 27 and I'm 47 now. It's my 20th year. Mm. And looking, so I have a bit of hindsight now. And, and although I haven't, didn't, or maybe haven't yet played a PGA Tour event, um, I've really had some amazing and remarkable experiences in golf um you know aside from playing like i i, I did caddy on uh, caddy the bolero texas open i caddied in the senior major and got Jarby job anyway so like i i've had wow. just some really um amazing amazing golf experiences and and so it's uh yeah it, it's it's been amazing. <laughs> Looking back at it now, have you ever gotten a, a sponsor exemption? Uh, not to a PJ Tour event. Um, I, I did try and go for one um, uh, with AT and T Pebble Beach Pro Am, um, mm. and I was like, uh, they they told me. Because I, I got a lot of my golf journey starting in the, on the Monarch Peninsula, uh, mm-hmm. and so that, and I met my wife, my now wife, um, on the Monterey Peninsula when she was in grad school there. So um, that area of the country means a lot to me, and um, so I was like, they, they told me I was one of the, the this past year one of the final people in there considering for a spot. Mm. And they ended up going to it was, uh, somebody else, but I was like right there in the running, so. I haven't gotten one yet. Um, perhaps I'll get one. Um, but I, I live in Detroit now, and um, the Rocket Mortgage Classic is here, and so I, I threw my name in the hat um, for one for this year. It's it's March now, and this the tournament is coming up in June. I'll make a decision in May, and um, the Rocket Mortgage uh, is the, the the big sponsor. And, um, to have um, Detroit is a, a very important company and the revitalization and, and building up of Detroit. And I'm currently the only, uh, myself and a, another guy who's 60, I believe, um, are the only pros that live in city limits. Um, so I, I think like I have a, I mean, we'll say I have a, I think I have a good shot at getting warm this year just because I am on here in the city, I'm really involved in the city today. My wife and I did, uh, uh, we did part of an effort to plant 150 trees in our, our awesome. neighborhood. Um, so uh, I have a letter of recommendation from our neighborhood association from city council. Um, so there's, uh, I have a good package. There's a lot of play when it goes into giving world sponsor exemptions. Glad to be in the running. I hope I get one, um, and you know, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens. We'll find out in a couple of months. Yeah. Well, fingers crossed for you, buddy. That'd yeah. be amazing. That would be amazing. That, that would be a nice. That would be. A, and then this year, with it being my twentieth year, um, I, I turned pro in July, of, or the first week of July of twenty two thousand three, and just kind of has in the last week of June and twenty. 23 so it's it's basically it would be like a really cool thing to to get in the plan this tournament because it's almost exactly 20 years uh um, wow. since i came pro wow wow and then so what do you want to do for your 20th anniversary play in this obviously play this oh this yeah event. yeah but, <laughs> but i mean to look, are you gonna like do anything to say now looking back on my 20 years of starting to wanting to be a golfer, to becoming a, a pro, to teaching, to becoming an entrepreneur, to getting involved in various businesses. And uh, like you've been doing so much over this 20 years. It's really impressive. Yeah. Um, well, next year I'm thinking about doing it a second generation of the Sterling Iron single wing clearance. That's, there's no hard date on that, but that's, that's a possibility, but that's next year. Um, so okay. for this year, 20th year, um, I was considering um, writing a book. Twenty years mm-hmm. was, was the, the the tentative title in my mind was twenty years on tour, life lessons learned through my journey in professional golf. 
Um, so I, I, I have um, a lot of notes hashed out um, already for what would go in that. Um, I've, I've had some really amazing experiences, um, done a lot of things that I ne never thought I would have done, learned a lot about myself and, and life. Um, so now I think, uh, you know, I still have some years left in my career, um, but now I just would, would be a perfect point, uh, a perfect marker to kind of like say, Hey, you know, it's been 20 years. What, what's happened here? And, and maybe put something together that people hopefully find interesting and, and maybe in, people find it in, maybe inspirational or, or help them and how little longer than in their lives and in, in some capacity. Mm. So we'll see. Well, it, it, it's, it's just in the notes stage, but you know, that's how these things start. It's, it's just, right. it starts with an idea like this, this tree thing that I just mentioned in our neighborhood. Yeah, exactly. Um, my, exactly. my wife and I moved to Detroit here and we were just walking around our neighborhood in the evening just to kind of wind down a little bit. And we're like, you know, there we need more trees in the in the the in our in our neighborhood. That um, probably about fifty years ago in Detroit, there was the city lost half a million trees, um, mm. and it used Detroit used to be called the city of trees. And oh. um, then the, all these trees got wiped out. So there's just a ton of like places when you drive around where it's like, oh, there there used to be a tree there. There there's a, a planter there, but it's not there anymore. Mm -hmm. And so we it just started out with this little idea, like you know, we need more trees. So one night we just went out and walked around our neighborhood, and we like marked every single place that uh, needed a tree and wrote the address down. And then, sure enough, there's a, a nonprofit here on the Greening of Detroit that was looking to pl to plant trees, and they didn't know where they were going to plant them. And we we inadvertently ran into them and said, "Hey, we got 200 trees that we where we know the spots that they need." And sure enough, they were able to give us 150 trees. So wow. these kind of things, like you know, this book at this stage is just an idea, but like. That's how all these things start. It's just someone thinks about it and then and then takes act as has the courage and strength to take action on it and then uh you need to come up with a plan and, and start on it and then be persistent and make it uh, you know, adapt along the way. Um and then just pick away at it and then lo and behold one day you you know, you have a swing speed training business or your own brand of golf clubs or like you're a professional <laughs> golfer or, you know, fill in the blank, really. <laughs> right. So when we first started talking years ago, you were just starting Swingman Golf. And I don't even think at the time Swingman Golf, uh, that even the technology was available to be giving lessons online. Is that primarily what you're doing these days is giving lessons online through that platform? Yeah, that that was yeah, two thousand seven. Um, yeah. Social media was just kind of starting. YouTube was just starting. Um, two thousand seven so was it, the year the iPhone came out. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, at, during the launch, there were no smartphones yet, and now I just want everyone has a smartphone. Oh, um, yeah. so the 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 technology back then it it, it was really innovative to like kind of take uh, golf instruction and golf training online back then. Um, so, yeah, it, it was kind of at the start of that, um, I would say, or, or more towards the beginning of this type of thing, particularly in golf, when golf is kind of a, a, a slow to, to adapt sport and, and yes. slow to move sport. Um, so I remember I tell people, like, oh, yeah, I don't think these pains were club, like, you want it in a club? <laughs> people just didn't get it and now like now that's more yeah i wouldn't say it's common but like there's there's youtubers and influencers and a lot of people have websites and, and those kinds of things so the technology's really come around and yeah so like i i still have about swimming golf website it's still up and running it's still working we're still making updates but um there's still activity and there's people 
you know, we're doing the swing speeds and it's, awesome. it's still here. <laughs> great. Great. Well, buddy, it was great to catch up with you. It's been a long time. We've you now we've seemed to have known each other a long time now. And I, I really know. appreciate you agreeing to come back on Golf Smarter. Great talking to you again now. Good luck. Yes. Um, thank you so much for having me back on. I, I, I always enjoy you're always fun to talk to. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> Thanks. Hey, Jeff Watson, Santa Ana, California. Thanks so much for opening up today's episode. Now, as a Golf Smarter ambassador, Jeff chose to receive Tony Manzoni's video of The Lost Fundamental, and you can too. Send an email to golfsmarterpodcast at gmail.com and request our simple instructions to just leave a voicemail at our toll-free Golf Smarter line. And when you do, you can choose to receive one of three gifts, including a dozen balls with the Golf Smarter logo from O. Odin Golf, the golf brand that sponsors and pays everyday players. These tour quality balls are a fraction of the price of what you'll usually pay, and when you use the code GOLFSMARTER at checkout, you'll receive an additional 20% off the order. Their link is in today's show notes. You also have an option to receive a new glove and glove storage compartment from RedRoosterGolf.com. And of course, you can also get a private online link to Tony Manzoni's video of The Lost Fundamental. So please send an email, and I'll get back to you with some simple instructions of what to do and what to say. Write to golfsmarterpodcast at gmail.com or click on the Hey Fred button when you visit golfsmarter.com. And <laughs> you smell it? It's starting to smell like spring which means the Masters is just around the corner. And to celebrate, we'll get our annual visit from Dr. Bob Jones IV, the grandson of legendary golfer Bobby Jones. So how's this for remarkable? In the eight seasons between 1923 to 1930, Bobby Jones won 13 majors, which still includes the only true Grand Slam of all four majors in the same year. Six months after he won the 13th, at the age of 28, he retired from tournament golf. That's next week on Golf Smarter. And I'm thinking of experimenting with having two guests who've each been featured on the podcast before and having them together on the show at once. What do you think of that idea? And who would you like to suggest we have on together? And if you have any questions or comments or suggestions about which two guests you'd like to hear at the same time on talking to each other about game improvement, please click on the Hey Fred button when you visit GolfSmarter.com.